So I found out this afternoon that the pre-2019 ECAA papers, past papers, have lots of, right at the end, to move a paper to two like questions, like necessary sufficiency, if then, if and only if, uh, there's even a negation question in here. For some reason they stopped asking it after 2020, which is why I didn't notice, because I've only looked properly at the 2020 and 2021 papers before today, which is really unfortunate, because otherwise I would have done this a while ago. But yeah, there are some good extra questions in here to practice. I suggest that you have a go at these before I do each one. And But yeah, questions like this, uh, so which must be true, that's asking about which are necessary, isn't it? So which of these things are necessary if you have this? So we've got two numbers, A is less than or equal to B. Uh, which of these are necessary? So um, I mean, I've said this so many times, counter examples is the theme of the day. So counter examples, can we find an A which is less than or equal to B, but makes this not be true? Because um, therefore, it, uh, if, if it is, then it doesn't have to be true. Um, so A equals minus 2, B is 1, minus 2 is less than 1. If we do this, though, we get 1 over minus 2 is greater or equal to 1 over 1, which is definitely not true. A minus a half is not greater than 1, so that's not it. Um, this is actually necessarily true. You can try and find some counterexamples, but because 2 to the a and 2 to the b are both increasing functions, strictly increasing, it means when you put in a bigger number into it, you're going to get a bigger output. So that one is actually necessarily true. This one clearly isn't. Just choose c to be a negative. When you're looking for inequality questions, think negatives for your counterexamples, because you know from year 8 maths that negatives mess up inequalities, because like when you times or divide by a negative, it swaps the, the the direction of the sign. So yeah, choosing a negative in here messes this one up as well, and 2 is the necessary one. Okay, no, another one. Uh, which of these is sufficient this time? So talking about sufficiency. So we've got a curve. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to do some sketch. So we've got a curve here. It's a, it's a cubic. I don't know whether it's positive or not, but it's definitely a cubic. It has a maximum stationary point x equals 0. So somewhere on the y-axis has a maximum stationary point. I'll call it c. I'll put a line through here to make sure it's a stationary point. It's a maximum, remember. Um, and then we've got a minimum uh, in this quadrant here, x greater than 0, y less than 0. So a minimum down here. So it must go maximum through here, minimum through here. That means a must be positive. There's no way for a to be negative because the cubic's not going to go through here if that's here is a minimum, like it can't come up here and minimize, like it doesn't work. So A has to be positive. So get rid of all those. A is positive. Now let's actually consider the turning points a bit more. So differentiate this and we get this. And uh, okay, we can solve that for when it's zero. We clearly get X is zero and we get A is, and we get the other solution at minus 2B over 3A. Now that there is a positive X value because we've been told it is. So therefore one of B or A is negative to make, to cancel with that negative and give positive. So a and B have to be of different signs. Um, so I can cross out the ones where A and B are the same signs. So that's this one and this one where they're both greater than zero. That can't happen. And because I know that A is greater than zero, that means B is less than. So that's cool. Okay, last thing to consider is the nature of the stationary points. So this is a minimum up here. and a, a, Sorry, this is a maximum up here. This is a minimum down here. So let's differentiate again and, uh, and plug in X is zero. If X is zero, that makes 2B. So this is a maximum we know, so we need this to be less than zero. But that's okay because we know b is less than zero. So that actually all checks out. And if we substitute the other x in, it looks complicated, but it just all cancels and you get this. And we need that to be greater than zero because that's the minimum. But of course, b is less than zero, so that's definitely good. So I didn't actually learn anything from doing that, um, which is disappointing. So how do I actually figure out these two things? Well, okay, which is sufficient is the key word here. Not what's necessary. I think what I just did was work out which are all necessary, but which is sufficient is a slightly different question. And um, which can ensure this? Now, what's the last thing I haven't considered? Well, if this C is up here, it's possible for this minimum down here to actually be up there, which is in the wrong quadrant, because then the cubic could just do this. So it's sufficient to push C just below the x-axis. If I push C down to here, then because that's the maximum, that ensures that this minimum point is down here in the correct quadrant. So it's sufficient to say that C needs to be less than zero to ensure this. C doesn't have to be, because what I had before could work to go through here, down here, and through here. But it's sufficient to push it down here to ensure that this one is there. And so that's the sufficient condition. Quite a nice question. Really testing your, your knowledge of sufficiency. I like this question, but I'm not happy about the answer. And I'm going to need some help in the comments to, uh, to show it to me. So anyway, you've got three light bulbs. And the rule is, if x is off, or if y is on, then z is on. OK, I, I'm making a little table. Now, the key thing here is, when you read this first statement, it's really tempting to go, oh, yeah, that's true, um, because it's just the opposites, right? Um, Sorry, not this one, but uh, yeah, 
Is it this one? If if the, then if that's off. Yeah, sorry. It's really temp because it's in the opposite order, isn't it? If x is off or if y is on, then z is on. If that is on, then x is off or y is on. Like, it's really tempting to say that's true because it's just the opposite statement, but that's not the case. And read this statement here for me. So, it is known that if I bench rest in the morning or running the afternoon, then I eat a big dinner. Now, it's tempting to say, therefore, that if I eat a big dinner, then that means I bench press in the morning or run in the afternoon, but that's totally not true because I can assure you I never bench press in the morning. I never run ever. And, but I always eat a big dinner, like every single day. And so this is just true regardless of these two things. So I don't need any of these things to happen. So actually, what this statement, uh, uh, what this example is trying to tell me is that this statement here tells me nothing, absolutely nothing, about when Z is on. Because, for example, Z could be on all the time, like all the time. Just because it's on when X is off or Y is on, it could just be on all the time. So it doesn't tell me anything about when it's on. Like here, I could just eat a big dinner every single day. And that doesn't tell me anything about what else I get up to in the day at all. Right? So none of these are true. Now, let's get to the next ones then. So if X is off, if Z is off, now, okay, if Z is off, we can actually figure this out. So if Z is off, then X can't be off as well. Because if X was off, that would turn Z on. So X has to be on. And likewise, y, if y was on, z would be on. So y has to be off. So we can say, if z is off, then x is on and y is off, which is this one, except it's not quite because of the or. And I'm really annoyed about this because it's definitely not these, I mean, it's definitely not these three. It's definitely not these two. The answer scheme tells me it's e, but I'm not happy about it because I don't think it should be or. It should be an and, right? I need both these things to happen. If z was off, this would be on. And if y was on, this would be on. So I need them both to be like this. So I'm I'm pretty confused about this word. Maybe people can help me out with it. But anyway, moving on to the next question. This is from the spec paper instead. Um, for numbers A and B, blah, 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 which of those things must be true? So which necessary counterexamples, just like the first question we did today? Um, so okay, A is bigger than B. So I need to find counterexamples where A is bigger than B, but this doesn't follow. Um, now the problem is that's going to be hard to do because when you just multiply this statement by minus one, the sign swaps and you get two negatives, which is actually what's happened here. They've just written it the other way around. So this is true. When you multiply, you just flip the sign, this becomes true. Um, now this here is interesting. Move the 2AB to the other side, and you can factorize this to be this. Now, regardless of what A and B are, this is true. Absolutely regardless what A and B are. So this one's kind of interesting because this is necessary for any A and B, not just for this statement. So anyway, this one's necessary because you just times this by minus one and you know this to be true. This is true for anything. This one, just like the first question, just use C as negative and uh, you just immediately end up with a nice counterexample. So that one's not necessary and you get one and two only. Good. Uh, uh, this is from 2017 now. You've got a graph. So guess what I'm going to do? Yep. You've got it dis exactly two distance points. So it could look like this. Here's a graph that intersects x-axis at two points. Now, when you move a graph up, clearly it doesn't necessarily still have two distinct roots because if you move it up far enough, it could just be up here so, uh, above the x-axis. So that's clearly doesn't necessarily have two roots. Now, this one is just moving it left and right. If it has two roots and all you're doing is shifting it left and right, it's still going to have two roots. So that's fine. If you stretch it, now the stretching happens at the roots, like this graph, the roots are stationary and the graph stretches around them. So it goes taller here, through this root, taller there, through that root and taller there. So it's still gonna have two roots because they don't move. So that one's fine. This one's a bit more complicated. Say minus f of x plus two. So now we're gonna flip it in the um, y axis, sorry, in the x axis and then move it up two. Now for this one, that clearly has two roots still. I mean, it has two roots when you flip it. When you move it up, it's still gonna have two roots. Clearly, right? They're just going to be further apart. But the problem is, does that necessarily happen all the time? Because this one is more complicated, right? There's two things to do. And what you can think of is instead of a quadratic, which is the easiest one to think of and what they're hoping you'll think of, think of a cubic that has two roots. Well, for a cubic to have two roots, it needs to do this, right? And it has to have a, a, a repeated one here. Now flip that in the x-axis and then move it up two places. And now it has three roots. So it doesn't still have two. So that one could change. And that's quite a hard counterexample to think of, 
but you've just got to be on it and try and 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 uh, and think of some different types of graphs, the ones that you're not they're not expecting or wanting you to think of. Think of some different ones. Uh, this one um, just flips it in the y-axis. That doesn't change the roots, and then stretches it. That's not going to change how many there are. So that one's clearly going to be true as well. Um, so it's going to be three of them uh, 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 fine, and two of them aren't. Uh, Thirty-six. I really liked this question. This was great. So we've got three statements here. Um, if a pig has horns, then it can't can breathe fire. If a pig, blah, 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 blah. You see a pig with wings breathing fire. It has no horns. Okay, so we're, we're seeing a pig breathing fire and it has no horns. Let's look at this statement. If a pig has horns. Now, okay. By seeing this pig here, I learn nothing at all about pigs that have horns. Nothing. Because this pig doesn't have any. So this, I, I learn nothing about the truth of this statement because I don't know anything about pigs that have horns. I've only ever seen one that doesn't. So, okay, we can cross that out. If a pig can breathe fire, then it has wings. Now, the pig that I've seen has wings breathing fire, but that doesn't necessarily mean that every pig that breathes fire has wings. That just means that I've seen one that has both. So I, I can't deduce that this is definitely true, because it could be that pigs have wings, some pigs don't have wings, some breathe fire, some... It could just be... In, uh, they don't have to be related. It could just be completely... Some have some can, some can't. Last statement, if a pig has wings, then it has horns. Now I'm looking at a pig here with wings that doesn't have horns. So I know that this statement is false. And that's the only one that I can say. That one is definitely false because I've seen a pig with wings that has no horns. Good, I liked that question. Moving on to 2018 now. Got a, I should have put this in the stats and probability thing because it's a quite a nice question that I uh, just missed when I was making that. Okay, so we've got 20 students taking mass test, mean mark 70, so just times the mean mark by the total to get the total number of marks, which is 1400. Um, the range is this, apparently. Five new students join the class, and the new mean for the 25 is this. So do this times this to get this, and you work out that the five new students have 300 extra marks. Divide by five, the mean of the five new students is 60. Which of the following must be true? All the students, all the new students scored 68 or less for this test. I mean, the mean is 60, so one kid could have forced 70, one kid could have forced 50, and then the rest could have forced 60. So, so no, no. One kid could do really well, and the others could do really badly. The mean of the marks for the new five was 60. Well, that's true, because I just worked it out. When the, new, when the marks for the new uh, kids are included, the range was unchanged. Well, clearly that's not necessarily true, right? Because if the mean was 18, one of these students could have just got one less than the worst kid before, and that would increase the range by one, and there's no information that says that that can't happen, so that's clearly not true, and two is the only true one. Bit of a weird one, this last one, it just made no sense as to why you would think that was true. But anyway, here's the statement, ooh, a negation one, f of x greater than x, so read this in English, f of x is greater than x for all real values x greater than one. So the first thing you do is change the is to a is not, so f of x is not greater than x, for, and then for all real, I did this in the negation video, changes to for some value of x greater than 1. Um, of course, not greater than is, e is the same as less than or equal to. And for some, more properly, you can write as for at least one real value. Uh, and that directly goes to this one here. So quite an easy one, that one, actually. Uh, number 35, a cubic is this. Uh, it's a monic cubic. A is 1, notice. That is actually really important for this question. Two of its factors of this, uh, which of the following is necessarily true? So sketch it, of course, it's a cubic with roots at one and minus one, so sketch those down. It's a cubic that goes through those two. Which of these are necessarily true? Now this one's interesting, let's start with it. If f of zero is k, now f of zero is on the y-axis, right, where x is zero. So it goes through it at some value k, but we know that's equal to d. So k is equal to d, okay. And now f of k, apparently that makes f of k zero. Now, take this polynomial and factorize it using these two factors that you've got. The last factor must be x minus d because you've got a single x cubed term, so this just must be an x because x times x times x is x cubed. This must be d because minus 1 times 1 is minus 1 times minus d is plus d. So it should be minus d is what I should be saying. But that means there's a root at d. So it has a root at d, and that's really interesting because, of course, its y-intercept is also d. So f of 0 is d, it's y-intercept, but f of d is 0 because that's a root. So this is actually true. Um, and so it, it said k because it's just choosing 
D to BK, and then this is then true. Um, so that one's actually true, um, which is interesting. Uh, now, of course, you can put D down somewhere if you want to, so I'll put it over here, which makes the y-intercept over there. Uh, so D is some negative number, the y-intercept is some negative number, good. Um, but this graph right here just immediately makes these wrong. This factorizes to this, which is clearly not necessarily true because this picture is not that, uh, and this is not symmetrical in the y-axis, so that's not true either. So the first one is the only true one. Uh, a really nice, interesting question as well, I thought. Uh, good question. Good. Uh, consider the three statements. This. Uh, so I don't like if statements. I like if then. So this one goes if this then that. That's how you write that one. Uh, so ifs go this one then that one. Uh, try and find a counterexample uh, to this. Of course, uh, it's it's talking about inequalities. So use negatives. Uh, there they are. Um, if x is minus two, y is minus one. Minus two over minus one is two, which is greater than one. But x is not greater than y here. Um, so that one's not true. This one here. Um, now, this is interesting because if and only if means that if this, then that, and if that, then this. Now, I'm going to do that second one. I'm going to do if that, then this, and I'm going to disprove this um, because if I, again, choose a negative value, x is 1, y is minus 4. Minus 4 over 1 is less than 1, but 1 over minus 4 is not greater than 1. So this doesn't work this direction. It, I think it does work the other direction, which is interesting, but it definitely doesn't work that direction. And it needs to work in both for this to be true. So that one's not true either. And this one, very easy to show. I mean, I mean, very easy. X is 100, Y is that. I mean, I was being deliberately obtuse when I chose that example. Um, but yeah, cl clearly, clearly not true. So none of them are true. Good. Uh, 2019 then we've moved on to. I think this is the last paper that had these questions in it. This one, this, if that, so if that, then this is how I'm going to change that. Well, that's true. If you substitute x as 1, you definitely get this. That's true. Uh, this one, only if, means you go if um, this, then that. But that's not true, right? Because if x is 2, it also works. Um, so it's not only if x equals 1. If x is 2, that works. That's not true. And if and only if, as I said in the previous question, requires this and this to be true. But only this one is. So that's not true either. And so we get our answer of 1. Excellent. I think this is maybe the last question I'll be doing. I'm not sure. When that's expanded, well, okay, let's just expand it then. There it is. I've collected the terms by their x coefficients. Um, so a dx plus bcx is a d plus bcx, and likewise for these ones. Um, now, which is sufficient for this expansion to equal that? So essentially, notice this doesn't have an x term. So which of these is sufficient to make this go away and be 0? Um, now, b equals minus d is not sufficient. Because if a was 5 and c was 1, just having this equal to minus that would not make it 0. So that's not sufficient. It could work if a and d were equal. Sorry, a and c were equal, which is this one here, and that's fine. Um, this one clearly is sufficient because you just rearrange that and you get this. So that one's clearly sufficient. Um, and this one, like I said, if a and c are equal, then you just want d and b to be 1 negative, 1 positive. Um, and, uh, and it'll be fine. So those two work, and this one doesn't. Not sufficient, sufficient, sufficient is the answer. Is that it? Yep, that's it. That's all the questions I could find. Uh, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.